Hey, what's up everyone? It's Game Dev Micah on Twitter, on Blue Sky, LinkedIn, it's Micah Berninghausen. And today we're going to talk about how to render, or what I think is the best way to render, Niagara components. Previously I was just putting smoke in in a different way, which is I would spawn an emitter wherever I need it and let it kill itself, age off. Doing so doesn't allow you to, from the looks of it, instance smoke. If you then take instead and gather all those locations that you need a particle effect, build an array with it, and send that array of locations to a single Niagara emitter, it will go ahead and instance all those particles into a single draw call, which is what we're seeing here. Uh, stat unit. We have 47 draw calls. And I believe some of that's the text. So if I cut out looking at the words, we're down to 32 draw calls. Um, that's way up there in the corner. I can try and widget reflect it, but just believe me. We have about uh, 32 draw calls. And we bring in the text, we get up to 44. Now, the neat part about that is I'm going to go ahead and escape out here and hit play again. Now, in this version of the very same level, what we're doing, and you're seeing the, the performance is a lot worse, is we're spawning, like I was, a particle system that emits one particle, and then at the death of that one particle, kills a system. So here we have 24,000 emitters that are living for 20 seconds each and dying off. And it looks like that is ending up giving us about an 8,700, almost 9,000, well, now it's 9,000, 9,500. We'll see where it limits out here. Maybe it won't. Uh, 10,000 right now, 11,000 draw calls. So that draw calls just keep going up. If we look away from the fog, oh, it's still there. Ugh. That's weird. So, yeah, these are individual emitters. This would be 24,000 actors in the world spawned or components that are, have their own timers ticking to delete them. And that's what's making this block of uh, effects. And if we just escape out and instead take all those transforms and instead of spawning components there, we have Niagara just spawn particles there directly. Boom, so much better. Look at that frame rate. It's, just, it's a ridiculous difference. Our draw calls are now 44. So let's look at the blueprints on how I route these two different particle systems into Niagara. Now I do end up summarizing them in one particle each for this uh, example here. <laughs> and, what, and that's what you're seeing here is these orange puffs of smoke and the gray puffs of smoke. Those are two separate particles that are being emitted on demand each frame. And so we can go ahead and look at type 1 and type 2. Uh, it's just sort of fun to fly through these particles. This is basically a volumetric smoke system if you were to enable collisions or something like that on these particles. They're all being rendered on the GPU and you'll see this is entirely done on the GPU. And we are on a 4090, so I got all the horsepower on this one. But these types of optimizations will work even, are even more important for lower end graphics cards. <clears throat> so here's the level. We have four, uh, uh, let's look at this blueprint I have for the level. And I put a lot of cleaning up into my blueprint so it should go nice and clean and have lots of uh, detail for you to look at. And I'll go ahead and improve the size of the screen as well as we look through these blueprints. I'll even step up here. Hopefully you can hear me well. All right, so this is my level. My level is called VFX Benchmark. So we can go ahead and check the difference between spawning emitters at each location and letting them kill themselves or using a single emitter and routing all that information to it every frame, which is what we ended up doing and tends to run the best. To do that, I have a blueprint. Inside this blueprint, let's just start at the beginning. How I am for the example we're looking at here, flipping between spawning instances, or rather spawning instances to a single emitter or spawning separate components for each location, is I'm using a save file. And that save file has just a bool in it that's making the decision. Every time we load the save file, we swap the bool and resave it. And that's how I'm doing it every time I hit play. So here I have, and let's zoom in. 
How does that look? That looks okay. All zoomed in. So we'll try going at this level here. Begin play. We load our save from our save slot. We made a custom save file. All this is, we'll go ahead and look at it, because why not? Because it'll be hard finding it. That's why not. It's just a save blueprint of the type, save game. And I've opened up that save game and added a single variable in there called a, a bool variable. And that bool variable we'll see here in a moment. So we create that same file. We do a valid to find out if we actually were able to load it from the slot. So that's one thing you can do here. You can load from a slot. If it failed, then we'll create a new save. Oh, and here's the save file, right? Boom. So I named it BP Save Game Niagara Test. And inside there, widget reflector, let's go for it. Inside that save game that we're loading just to look and see which way we spawn things, I have this bool here, single emitter, that we just swap on and off. Oh yeah, that's nice and big now. So there, we try to load that save game, save it as a, as a, lo as a file. If it was successfully loaded, meaning we have it, then we don't need to create one. We'll go ahead and load it, cast it to our custom save class, or the BP that we just made. I'm sorry I'm going really detailed here, but I don't know who's watching this. I know when I watched tutorials, simple things like the name of variables could screw me up. So I want to try and be as clear as I can on these variable names and what I'm doing. Here's where I'm flip-flopping that bool on the save game. And then I resave it. So I save this choice of what which one we are now, and then I uh, change that and save it back to the save file for the next time we run. Then we have our emitter choice. Are we going to go ahead and do it as a single emitter or multiple? Single emitter comes up to the top here. And what we're going to do is, uh, well, I don't want to talk about that, do I? Okay. Single emitter comes up to the top here, and we're going to get some basic inputs. How many spawns per second, or how many spawns per frame, and then what delay between spawning. So, and I have no delay right now set up between spawning, and I'm doing 10 spawns per uh, frame. This will just populate the text because uh, for our on-screen display. So we can use this emitter text later to just do that uh, on-screen display you were seeing, the, set the text. We then spawn our VFX manager. This is a custom blueprint I've written so that I can send it this information. It will go ahead and correlate it and send it off to the, basically this, the VFX manager is managing those single emitters and processing all the data that can be sent to it and sending it to those emitters. So we'll walk through that blueprint as well. So I spawn that and get a reference to it. And I also set uh, the text for one of my fonts here. So this is really just my overhead to do my benchmark. So this is just saying, hey, we did one emitter for this spawn count per so on. It's just doing my text. If we do multiple emitters, this is again the begin play, then we'll come through here and for multiple emitter, we'll set this amount, the detail here. So same thing as above, only we're gonna say a different text just so we know what we're going on there. We're doing one emitter instead of multiples as it says above. And then we'll set this other piece of text as well. Sorry for the, the silliness there. So that's just setting up the text to tell us what's going on and spawning the VFX manager, which is important. Now every tick on our tester here, we come through, get delta seconds. I mean, we'll find out why, I forget. Come to a sequence. The top part of the sequence here, this is storing, oh, delta seconds. We're getting it because we're storing our frames per second and our delta time for that output. So the top part of this is just how I do that. I do it historically. So every tick I'm coming through here, I'm grabbing delta seconds, I'm putting it into a array, I'm cycling that array based on an index, so I store just the last three, and I just set those indexes. And then what we end up doing is taking, when we update the display down here, which we do uh, only every uh, 60 times a second, because don't, I don't care that much, is we'll come down here, get our frames per second history, which is those three values that are set, find the largest, or 
the minimum, the smallest one of those, because this is our frames per second history, that'd be our lowest frame rate. And we'll pass that into my overhead, my, my, my text. We'll come through and get the highest delta time, pass that in the text, and then we'll put in our two generated texts from above. So that's all just the overhead of how to manage the, the uh, benchmark. So at this point, 10 minutes in, let's look at sending the data and generating the data to Niagara. So event tick comes through after taking care of the text interfaces and goes over here. We have a spawn delay, so that will do the only spawning as much as we wanted to or have we set, which is zero right now, so this is just ignored. Passes through, go to a sequence. The sequence is gonna come up here, and this is where we're generating our particle locations into two arrays. This would be where you would, you know, uh, have perhaps a hit event on your uh, mesh at a indication here of a hit and spawn a smoke particle or whatever you need to do to drive your data on how you need particles to spawn would happen here. So this is saying, hey, here's my arrays, append them together, do whatever you want of each type which I'm just calling those two arrays so we could have the type difference in this uh, tutorial. So you can have two different types of emitters. So this is generating two types of emitters and two arrays. We take those arrays of transforms locations on where there's a, we want particles. We come down here now in our sequence and we use our emitter choice. That's where we're just basically saying, hey, which one did we want to load out of the save file? Do we want to spawn individual emitters or our single emitter? If we choose to spawn an individual emitter, which is this blue one here, we'll go ahead and pass that data. I'm going to pause on that because right below, if we spawn multiple emitters, that's what we're doing here. We're taking our first emitter type transforms, doing a loop through them, and spawning these individual smoke emitters. And let me show you the individual smoke emitter, single emitter type, and what happens in here, just for full you know, transparency. I'd love some details. If as we're going through this, you see something that could improve performance to these individual permitters or anything at all that I've missed, I'm just trying to learn this. Please help me and, and that will help everybody else too as I'll uh, be able to hopefully include that in the next video. So here's my uh, Niagara single emitter and this is there's nothing special in here. This is being spawned at a location and doesn't need to know about anything else. The values you see over to the left, that's because I just made a copy of the one we're going to look at uh, where we input a bunch of values. So yeah, this is just spawning an emitter type that has a specific smoke material where the other emitter type being spawned, emitter type 2, just has a different smoke material. So that's all its difference between emitter type 1 and 2 in our example here. You could do whatever you want to your uh, different emitter types, right? <clears throat> so we spawn out of those arrays all of the individual ones for the benchmarking and then we clear out the arrays up here at the end of the sequence. Now when we're doing a single emitter we will go ahead and come up top here, take our two gener generated arrays from right above with our where we want our particles and what I'm doing is I'm using a map. This map is of type, uh, uh, just a simple byte type for indicating what type of emitter I'd like or particle I'd like to spawn. And that's, I'm just using it as numbers right now. So I just have one, the number one, number two as my two emitter types. And then I link that to my template for those Niagara systems. So, so that's what well, that happens somewhere else. Here, I'm telling it, use that template type or that byte, and here's my transforms of where I want those particles to be. So I know ahead of time, for byte one, or particle type one, here's the transforms I want you to put those at this frame. For byte two, or particle type two, put these transforms there. And I put that into a map, so I can put as many different bytes as I wanted to as I populate out my different um, particle system needs and just funnel in arrays. I then take that map of VFX types 
and pass it over to my VFX manager. And then I tell my VFX manager to go ahead and process those new particle needs and clear out the map for next frame. And that's what the uh, benchmarking system for this is looks like. We come in and we, we, so we just went through that. Main things being that every frame we're generating two arrays of locations that we want particles at. And I'm then building a map of saying that there's two types that are byte datas. And on the other side, we're getting arrays of locations to spawn those types. We're then passing that over to my VFX manager right here and telling it to process it. Here's the VFX manager. What the VFX manager does, is there even a begin play in here? No. Is just on that one call where it says, hey, process these new VFX frame input. That's coming from what we generated over here. It will come in and say, hey, I make sure that I have two, I, I have two different maps, a general map and a always spawn. We're only showing the always spawn right now, but what you would do over here, um, you can see right here we decided to pass the data to always spawn is we can come in here and set general and this would be where you could tear out your particles so you could decide however you're generating them hey these particles are too far away from the player they should go in the general particle map and then on my VFX manager I can say hey up here we can go through and get a count. We could start counting up how many VFXs we've spawned as before we passed them off and then start limiting how many of the general that we spawn. So that's where I'm gonna put some of those optimizations or performance controls in place, excuse me. But in lieu of that, we pass our generated arrays two types of locations over as always spawn to our VFX manager. Our VFX manager then says, okay, cool. We got two types that we fed in here with data. So we'll get past this. We'll go ahead and set that since we have the two ones here and get into a loop where we rip through those types and grab out the locations to spawn. So we'll grab type, the first type out of the map, see if we have it in our array yet or if we've spawned that particle system yet. If we've not spawned that particle system yet, we'll go ahead and look in our map here where we do have type to uh, particle effect system um, template. And so here, I we had the single emitter spawns over here that didn't have any input. And now I have these type one, type two. They're just a clone of each other, just like these, where all I do in here is change the, the material between these two. So there's no reason to look at them besides just to show you there's two different emitters. They're using different materials. So you can go ahead and call them in between using that type reference. There's a lot of important stuff that happens in here though. So we're going to go through this in detail. <clears throat> so we find, so we're just to walk through, we get some data in from our system to the VFX manager we grab the types, we see in our map if we've spawned that system before or not. If we have not spawned it before, we spawn an Niagara system at a location, centralize it to the middle of the map because you do have, when you do GPU um, particles, you have to set fixed bounds. I have mine at 100,000 positive and negative on X, Y, and Z. It works. So, but put it in the middle of your map so you know at 100,000 all around, the GPU issues are going to start happening. And you can recenter it and manage that stuff. But that's what's going on right here. You center your system and you have your GPU fixed bounds based on that center point. So keep that in mind. I store my Niagara system. Uh, I, the tick behavior, I'm not sure what to tell you here. I think this was part of me troubleshooting. I'm not sure if it's uh, setting use prerequisites is nice. What this is doing is saying Niagara will tick. So the particle system will tick only after all of the attached things, such as this blueprint, have ticked and done their data. And so that should mean that Niagara is going to wait for us to send them this particle location data before it ticks and spawns stuff. But, ah, sorry, I don't have that one hammered down yet. But, so you spawn your Niagara system off your template from your type. 
you add it now to your map. So that now when you come back through and you look for it, you'll see that type in your map as a particle system that's been spawned. I'm not sure if I need to do this check here to see if there's transform or do have systems to spawn or not. That should be assumed, but I'm doing it anyway. We then come up here and we're going to split out the type of data that we're able to actually send to the Niagara system. It cannot accept large structures such as a transform array. It can, the big, biggest thing it can accept is a quantrudian array, so four ints. Um, but I have arrays of vectors, so we'll just send arrays of vectors in. <clears throat> so we have two maps here. We have VFX data per emitter scale and VFX data per emitter positions. And we have those VFX types. These two data types. Now, where did those come from? Because that's, that's important. I think we're passing it in. Did I show that, though? We need to split it out from right there. Sorry, might as well walk through it together. We send in here transforms. Data here. Type here. Coming up. Here, local loop. Here's those transforms. Are they empty? No. VFX data positions. Let me find out where this comes from. I'm going to pause the video for a second. All right. I figured it out. So what we're doing here is you can, if I can send in multiple requests. Or, well, I want to be able to send in multiple requests for the same... Niagara system type with particle locations and have it get piled up. So what this is trying to do is grab those individual VFX types and their positions and scales, which would be ripped out here shortly, if they currently exist. And if they don't currently exist in the map, then we'll clear them out. So that's what we're saying here is, hey, does this VFX the type, does this VFX type, one or two, they uh, exist currently in our VFX data scale or position arrays. If true, grab the existing locations that we need to spawn particles at and store them. If false, clear those two variables because because you know there's there's no particles to spawn. So we have a clear map to add these particles to that we want to spawn. Then we come over here map our, grab our particle type, one or two, grab the spawned particle Niagara system from it, just for good measure, and set it. Grab the map we have made, or that got sent in, which is our always spawn transforms. Grab the VFX type that we're working on right now, one or two, and split out all those spawn locations and add them into our offload locations array and scale array. I divided by two just because uh, I, I wanted to, I found that to be needed for me. That's up to you. So we split out all those locations. Also up here you see this for loop. If you wanted to say multiply your particle spawns, you could do that very easily here. You could also do it in the scratch pad, which we'll talk about later. And it would be more efficient, I bet you, in the actual particle system to just spawn multiple particles with that one push. But you could do it here for it to be a little bit more simple uh, to get. By just doing this and doing this, you would then add the same location and same scale three times to that array and spawn three more particles. <clears throat> so after we've split out our new VFX type location spawn requests, added them into that low array, we're gonna go ahead now, add them into our VFX data positions and scale because I can now scale my particle when I pass that data over to Niagara and also set its position. And then I clear out those arrays I'm working on and the local loop which is that always spawn piece. These stay set. Then after that's all been completed which ultimately I should then make this as aspect here uh, be a late tick aspect, which I haven't done yet. 
because right now it's just happening in sequence. So what's going to happen here is that when this is called, this is going to be called. So we're not getting any of that stacking I want. What I want to do is make this bottom piece here, which I have not yet, this would be a last tick call or a first tick call um, right before we clear out these maps to spawn particles. So right now what we're doing is we're grabbing the scale and positions or maps that we made, grab the keys out, so it's be one or two for the type, rip through the loop on that for that type, find it in the map, find the Niagara system matching the type, so this would be the type one Niagara system that we want to spawn particles at. This would be the uh, out of this map here, this would be the type 1 map to vector array that we want to spawn the particles there. We set that as an offload array, and then here is where we actually tell Niagara, do, here's our variable, here's our data. This is our scale data, and I have this one here, it's just named input offload vector for array. That's what I named the variable in Niagara. It has no relation whatsoever to anything else. When you're setting this data, or when you're setting variables on Niagara, you use these nodes here off the Niagara system, set Niagara. And what they are is you get set bool, set color, set float, int, quintillion, uh, vector arrays. You can go to Niagara array to see all the arrays you can pass. Always passing arrays is more efficient. Um, and that's how you set data. But whenever you set these data, this data, even to include a set object, there's an object in here. You have to say what the variable name is specifically. Okay? And it matches whatever you named it. So we'll go look at that in Niagara now. So we've generated our data out here in our world just at random for this example but this would be all your other blueprints we took that data we put it in a map because we wanted to collect it and then we sent it over to our VFX system that VFX system is meant is here just to really pool together all the requests for VFX within the frame and then at the end dispatch those VFX requests out to the individual Niagara emitters but I don't have that implemented yet the, the very last piece, making sure that they all pool together. Right now, they instantly request to the Niagara emitter, which if I was doing this more than once a tick, um, would wipe each other out, right? One data would get wiped out. So that's why this doesn't work right now. Without separating that and making this tick late, right, let's see if we can do it. Tick, vent tick. We'll run this in here, get rid of that, and we'll just make it tick late. Yeah, this is like we're doing it live. Post update work, post update work. Now the question is where everything happens. Uh, 10 emitters, one particle each, 2400 emitters of one particle. Okay, no, that's the slow one. Play. All right, spawning. All right, there we go. So this would be, it's running right now. Oh, and look, isn't it funny how uh, the widget makes it look so weird? So I think it's working now. Spawning, uh, so I guess we could add two. Can't read it. Tick behavior. This is always weird. Um. All right, so that's what you would need to do. I don't know if I've done it right, is make sure this ticks last or first so that you can actually pass this data in. Why does it look like that? We've stopped play, right? All right. So the data pass in part, the important part. You have this array. Let's see, where do we say it at? 30 minutes in. Let's get to Niagara. I have this array, and why is it looking great like that? And let's go look at the particle, the Niagara system. Hmm. 
Not all these variables are needed. I'm doing more with this than we're going to talk about. Well, we will talk about it. It's a simple Niagara system. Uh, a lot of this stuff is in here because I just took a smoke emitter and dragged it in here and dropped it. Okay. The two things that matter is how we spawn things. You can see here the emitter update for spawning is a custom blue, uh, scratch pad mode I made. You see we're on GPU. That's great, right? So this custom scratch pad mode, let's look at it. Uh, it seems a little silly. This is what they look like. This is taking information from Niagara. These get map gets. This is how you get the information out of the system. I added a node here. This is how you build a variable in Niagara, but it's not a variable accessible outside of Niagara. What you do is you link a variable that is accessible called user user parameters which are these blue things on the side here you link them to Niagara variables which is what's labeled as input here you can name them whatever you want you'll see we're going to actually link them together so the names don't matter but what they do matter is the user inputs here are the ones that you're setting back in blueprints when you send that data so they do matter. They do and don't matter. Um, I want to find that specific spot right here. And let's look at the one that's named poorly. Input offload vector 4 array. So this right here, let's change it. This is actually needs to be my input. 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 Vector position array. I could put data in there. Right? So this is what I need it to be. It's not named that. If I leave it like that, it's going to say uh, unable to set constant. Maybe not yet, but that's what it's going to say. It can't, it can't set the constant of that name. So if we want to change it, we go back to the Niagara system, come over here, change this input offload vector for array rename it boom now this will actually get set by blueprints right here off the Niagara system if this isn't the right Niagara system it's going to try and set that variable to it and it won't be able to if it's the right system it's going to be able to set it there and that variable is all your locations to spawn so it's important So now you can see this didn't change. It's the same name, input offload vector four array. However, it does work. Let's show you where it's set. So here's where that custom scratch pad node is. I'm not even reading that. And in here you can see input vector position data array. We just changed that name. It was previously this. But that does update, and those, that does matter over here because it's being referenced from Blueprint, so it's a real variable. But the input offload vector 4 array is still poorly named, but it works. We've set it right here in the scratch pad module. Now let's go ahead and rename this thing too. That's a parameter right here. Rename, boom! And see now it's all messed up. Because now it's like, well, they're all named right. They must be linked. They're not, right? I just changed the name. So that's something that can definitely get you while you're doing this. Or at least it got me. <laughs> and now it's resolved, which is I have to link them. And I'm going to actually say here something different. Uh, so this is the spawn positions imported is what this actually is. So these spawn positions imported, since we linked them here, this is going every frame this happens emitter update occurs every emitter tick on the cpu so this is going to happen once 
before everything else since it's at the top of the Niagara stack. That's why we have it here. It's going to come in, grab the array that's been passed to it. So that's where you got to figure out when you passed it this data and tick or just when you're clearing it out. So that's there when you do this. How, uh, <laughs> this right here, length, we're just going to use this uh, standard length check to figure out how many array units was passed in. Make a spawn info. Make spawn info here. This is where you're requesting the generation of particles. Setting the map here doesn't matter. You have to do this, I think. But the name, spawn user data, doesn't matter. It doesn't. Just this doing a spawn, make spawn info and setting it to the emitter, I believe, then it sees a spawn info and executes on it. And, you, and this is happening um, every frame because this is happening at the beginning of the CPU. So that's how you spawn the particles. It's just that simple. Input map, let's click on it. It says parameter. It's just so you can see there's nothing changed in there from default, Niagara parameters, map. And we'll click on each of these. And the output node. And that's getting your spawns in. That's gonna create a bunch of particles. We have none yet because we have no array being passed in. Now to position these particles that have been spawned. We'll go down to another scratch pad, position custom spawn particles that was created. You open this up and what's happening here is we're taking input to new arrays or a Niagara uh, variable arrays of vectors that we're going to link input to. We're going to take those two arrays, which are our spawn location and spawn scales that we passed over and split out. Remove the last element. By removing the last element of the array, it maintains order and you don't resort it. So we rip off. So this particle, this happens on each particle only when it's initially spawned, which is this positioning in the uh, Niagara array order here, which is underneath particle spawn above particle update. So what will happen is it will go ahead and come in here, grab our location array and our scale array and this input vector array. Let's change it to input vector. Change. See, input vector position array. That's the, that what we want, right? So then we come up here and look at this node. Input vector array data, input vector position array. There, it updated. So now we're getting some name parity, but here's where we set the uh, variable match. And to do this, you use this drop down, you do link input, and it should show up. You had to create these variables over here, and so let's just do some so you see it. Super test here is, is one, but just let's make two new vector array. As you're not, see? It's, it, it tells you here what they are, but that's all there is to it. Um, test array. And now what we can do is take test array here, rename it so I can grab that. And if we wanted to come over here and put it here or create a new one of these, set vector array, call it this. Now we could pass data to it. And that would come in to and land right here, but it wouldn't get in the Niagara until you came over here and actually tied it to a Niagara variable. And then based on when that Niagara variable ticks, we'll let you know what type of effect you can have on those uh, arrays. So we come in here, we grab those two arrays that have been matched up out here and have our location, spawn positions and scales. Remove them and get their values and set the particle, particle position that just got spawned and set the scale. I have some other things here. Lifetime, set your lifetime, do it however you want. You could pass data in, set it hard set it like I have here, or, do, or set it with a different module. Because you can act on all this stuff once you spawn these particles. It's just a normal particle in the system. You can act on it however you want. I'm killing a lot of particles right here. I think it's because only because I'm doing it on the GPU. If I do this on the CPU, the particles seem not to spawn. If I do it on the GPU, I have excess particle spawns. And I simply just say, 
if I didn't have enough uh, locations to put the particles in my array that the GPU spawned, which just is right off this, is valid, just if I was able to remove the last element at the end. So if I spawn 10 particles a, sec a frame, and for some reason the GPU is spawning 20, the extra 10 will not have a location to match here. It will come back as valid, false, and they will just kill themselves. And it performs pretty well. If anyone knows how for, to, for me to trim that up, specifically when doing this on the GPU, uh, I'd love to know. Please let me know. And then we go ahead and set that, those, that data on that particle just when it's initially spawned. And that's our placing our locations and deleting the data out. That's it. <laughs> and there's the rest of the system. You can change your renderer to whatever you want. And so let's walk through it to make this even out. No, it's only 40 minutes, but let's briefly run through it one more time here at the end. Uh, so that, why not? In our VFX benchmark here, we spawn our, and I'm going to just go through the single emitter part. We come through and generate our locations. We want two different types of particles to spawn at right here, at random every frame. We take those arrays, which are full transforms of scales, which I just set, and uh, a random amount of X, Y, and Z, which is why we have a big cube. We come down and add those locations into, and by making uh, into a map I have, so I can do multiple different types. We have type one and two, which are just these byte references here. You could go as big as you want. I will be adding a lot more. This is so I can then pass a map rather than arrays to my uh, VFX manager and sort that map when it runs and bulk these requests into the same Niagara system as well in that manager and not force all my requestees to do it. So basically this VFX data always spawn being sent to the VFX manager is meant to be used by other actors in the world to consolidate or just to send their requests in with it. Hey, I have all these different types I want and I have these positions, which makes up that map. Here you go, VFX manager. Go ahead and, and spawn them. That's what these two nodes do. Here's my, my different types and the map I made up with the transforms where I want you to spawn them. Spawn them. And then clear that out here so I can do them more next frame. We come in here. We zip through all this, of course, and say, hey, do I have a Niagara system of this type yet? If I do, I go to it. If I don't, I come down here and spawn it. I add it in so I can find it next time. I come up here, I split out my scale and size off the, out of that map into vector arrays because that's the type of data I can pass to Niagara. I find the Niagara array. I, oh, right here we're doing a consolidate, we're trying to do a consolidation that doesn't work right now for this video. I apologize. I, I think it doesn't, maybe it does. But right here is where we're trying to take our existing this frame map of Niagara emitters and locations, store any locations being requested so that we can add more to it. So we can have multiple requests coming in. So this one right here is where we're doing that. And I have, didn't have it done for this video, I guess. I, I didn't know I was even doing it. <laughs> we obtain the VFX type. <laughs> we add more locations to spawn more scales to those arrays. Then we come down here and add it into a map of saying, hey, here's the VFX types. And we'll add that data back into the map for spawning. So that way this top part can run repeatedly every time a request comes in and it will take any existing type, emitter type, grab the locations out and save it, add to them, and then put them back into the map. And then when we decide to tick this, blueprint and actually spawn the emitters, which right now I'm just doing every tick at the end of the frame. We come through, grab the scale and positions, and grab the Niagara system that matches to it and send in that uh, consolidated array of spawn positions for each type as an array 
of locations right here by setting those Niagara vector array variables and then clearing it out. Then what happens on the in the Niagara system with that data? It comes in through these user variables set here, input scale and position, just those two, which are both vector arrays. We match them to some created, uh, which is spawn position imported here, is the Niagara vector array inside Niagara that then had to be matched or bound or linked to the input that matches for position. And I also do the same for scale down here where we place it. So position, we're just using that to count how many we want to spawn. You could send an int in instead of doing this, but it's you know easier to count some data you already have there, I guess. I think everything done in Niagara is going to be faster than you can do it in Blueprints. I guess, I hope. Um, we come in here, we get our pawn position imported, which is a Niagara variable that's been linked to our user variable, which has been set by our blueprint, and grab just a, a length, set it to the count. Make spawn info is how you actually spawn stuff, and then you set it to emitter, and that will force it to spawn particles for you. And then when you position it, so that's in the emitter update, in the particle spawn, so when that particle spawns from what you just requested, we have a, a custom scratch pad for spawning them there. I'll we'll come in here, grab the two or, or very variables or Ni Niagara variable vector arrays for position and scale that we've matched to our user variables that we set out in our VFX manager. Remove the last instances off both those arrays so they stay in order and then set the particle position and scale. Then we also set if it's alive based on if it was actually valid. So if we spawn more than we have in our array for some reason, since it's the GPU does, I think, to keep pooling up, we go ahead and kill them off instantly. And that's it. That's how you do it. All right, please uh, drop some questions down below. I'd love to know if there's improvements to this. Uh, what I've done with this system, so you know sort of the full breadth of it, is that I'm offloading my physics to it. So when I have <clears throat> small chunks of world meshes in the world, like a small piece of concrete. If I'm do needing those CPU physics, where I take that static mesh and just turn on simulate physics, if I'm doing that too much and I, I can't afford to do any more of it, I send the mesh over to Niagara with the particle position and it's now a GPU uh, physics, which is not as good. It, the, you don't get collisions that match the mesh and it doesn't roll and look like it's good, but you get movement. And in I'm working on now figuring out how to use your sync modes over here to pull that data back from Niagara, although I probably won't for this first game, uh, but pull that, ba that data back from Niagara so then you could sleep those small pieces back to ISMs ultimately, which would be really great because then you could actually offload physics to Niagara GPU and bring it back and not actually have to get rid of those particles or get rid of those meshes. So that's what I'll work on for the next game maybe or maybe the one after that because that's really, we can get a whole lot done with simulating um, physics on static meshes without going there. So it's going to be really small things like pieces of glass or small pieces of concrete or rubble or bricks that ultimately can go ahead and just age out and uh, maybe save us the development time right now. Um, additionally, any other additions to this? Rendering is important thing I'm gonna hit on again. Uh, the draw call difference you're seeing, there's, they instance this stuff together when you do it from a single emitter, but multiple emitters were not instancing together. So this makes sense purely on a draw call uh, requirements. Oh, and we broke it. So I'll go back and fix it, um, but thanks for hanging out. This works. <laughs> this is useful. This is how you should do your VFX. As for part of, for decals, it looks like decal render cannot be done on the GPU, but it probably still makes sense to do CPU Niagara decals instead of spawning and managing a whole bunch of decal actors. 
So that's going to be the next thing I do look at for this game is if we do the same thing for decals and use CPU rather than spawning it components in the world. And I bet you we do. So that will be the next video you see coming out. Have a great day. And uh, Tim Sweeney won. Epic won. It's a big win for all of us. A big win for freedom. I know I'm saying it at the end of the video here because I don't want to like hit you with it in the beginning. But that's awesome. It's helping to make things better for us, the game devs and the gamers, and helping to kill monopolies. I didn't even realize what was up. I mean, because you think about, well, I mean, I don't want to go get a different phone, okay? I don't want, I barely want to use this phone. But I have, if I go to a different phone platform, it's, it's, it's not just a phone anymore. It's now a phone as a service. So what Tim's doing, what they did, you know, I think he's doing what he's saying. A lot of people are like, oh, he doesn't mean it. And I just, I'm trying to find some ground for that they're coming from, but I haven't. So I'm just a happy guy. I'm a happy guy. So thank you, Tim, for sitting out there. You're making a lot of uh, the people figure it out. You're helping me figure it out. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great day. Ciao.